Welcome to video eight in a series of introductory videos for SolidCam. This video's topic is 2D iMachining. So in this video, I'll be covering iMachining as a whole, and we'll focus in the later half of the video on the 2D aspect of iMachining. So what do I mean by iMachining as a whole? Well, iMachining is our proprietary toolpath, and it uses information about your machine and your material and the dimensions of your end mills that you're using to generate optimized feeds and speeds. The 2D version is an optimized pocketing toolpath. So in this video, we'll see how that one works. So let's look at iMachining definitions, and then we'll do 2D. So iMachining definitions, this is something you can do when you first open up the cam part or come back to it like I'm about to do here. You can just go back in your cam part definition, and this lower section here under iMachining data is where we'll plug in that information about the machine and the material. So um, iMachining comes with some of these definitions already, a few of them in there, and then a majority of them in there. Uh, these are default uh, settings. You can use these for training and trial purposes, but for the use of iMachining, it's actually advised that you actually plug in information specific to your machine and your material. So we're gonna do that now. Um, I'm just going to go to Edit iMachining Database, and in this window that pops up, in the Machine section, we can right-click and say New Machine, and when that pops up, you can see that it gives us this information we need to plug in. At minimum, we want to plug in the highlighted information, the max spindle speed, the max horsepower, and the max feed rate of this machine. You can get this information from your machine supplier. You can get this from the web. Most machine websites, they actually have data sheets on their machines where you can get this information and directly plug it in. Likewise, for the material, it's the same thing. You just right click and say new material, and then the highlighted information is at minimum what we need to provide. Now, if you put more information in this window, you're, you're gonna better tailor your uh, toolpaths for your material. So it's, it's the, most inf the more information you put in, the better off you'll be. It's more optimized, it's more specific. But at minimum, we just need to add this information. And for the material, it's ultimate tensile strength. The ultimate tensile strength, you can get that from your machine supplier, sorry, your material supplier. You can also get it from the web. One place we direct you, uh, our customers to is matweb.com. This is a material library where you can find different bits of parameters on each of your materials. Uh, for instance, I'm using 304, so I just typed in 304, I did a search, and from the results, I found one that best fits my material. In this case, I just went to the generic 304, under the mechanical properties section, you can see it says ultimate tensile strength. The ultimate tensile strength of 304 is 73,200 PSI. So if we go to my definition, I just plug that in under ultimate tensile strength. So with those materials and the machines plugged in, we've defined our definitions for iMachining, we can start adding toolpath. Now I've added a toolpath, a couple of toolpaths already just to highlight the different functions of iMachining. So let's, let's take a look at that real quick. I'm just gonna open up the first one. And you'll notice that the iMachining interface is a little different than some of the other ones, especially it's equivalent on the 2.5D side, the pocketing side. It does basically the same thing, but 2D iMachining is an optimized version of pocketing. So you'll see a lot of different stuff in here, namely the feature recognition modes. This was added in, in more recent versions of SolidCam where we actually take this 2.5D toolpath and add a few 3D features to it. So this is not recognizing your target like you'll see with some of the 3D toolpaths, in the later videos in the series, what this is doing is allowing you to do gouge checking against the target. Um, and of these four options, we'll start with this one on the far right. This is kind of a classical way of doing pocketing. We're just gonna choose a chain like we did here. As you can see there, I just chose that bottom edge of the chain. And then we just choose our levels. So basically top of stock and right down to the bottom face of the pocket. Under tool, you can see that we have multiple levels here of tool. And this is using the multi-tool function. What this allows me to do is plug in all the tools I plan to use and every second, third, every subsequent tool will act as a rest milling operation. So we're gonna start with tool 24. That's my one inch tool. We're gonna to get it to do everything we saw in the geometry down to the levels we saw in levels. Uh, when we get to technology wizard, this is our control over that calculation. The calculation of iMachining is using the machine, the material, and now the dimensions of my end mill to calculate my fees and speeds. You can see them down here. You can also see them in the tool section under data where you would normally find your fees and speed control. These are locked out because iMachining is calculating these for us. Um, now, if you don't wanna use any of the stuff that you find from iMachining, you can always turn off the wizard and then take control over some of these calculations. But if you're using iMachining, it's because you're trying to optimize the toolpath. So we'll leave it as this. In the technology wizard, you can see that you have 
a step down control. By default, iMachining is going to take the full depth of cut of your end mill. So your full flue length will act as your full depth of cut. So this, in this case, this pocket is rather shallow for this, for this end mill. So under the ACP, actual cutting points along the flute, it's giving me a 0.74, pretty much meaning that there's about 74% use of that one flute on this, on this material. This is probably a multiple flute end mill, so there's probably other flutes picking up uh, as, it go, as it revolves, but the ACP is actual cutting points on that flute. So there's a tangent point in contact with the material probably 74% of the time. And the step down is letting me know that it's going to go full depth. In this case, it's just going to go that full one inch, whereas this end mill probably has an inch and a quarter of flute length. So the color indicates how efficient this is. This tool is a little too robust for this pocket, so it's giving me that kind of red color. If you don't like the step down, you can always go to user define, and then still using all the algorithms from iMachining, you can tell it that you'd rather do either a number of steps or put in a value for the step down. So let's say if I wanted to take quarter inch step downs, it's going to let me know that it's going to do that in four steps. That's the step down there. And ACP is about 0.18. So again, it's not a very efficient use of this tool if I'm going to go with such shallow cuts. If I go with number of steps, then I got to put a whole number in there. That's where that error is coming from. So let's say we do that in five steps. So then it breaks it down, tells me what the step down is, and tells me the ACP of that as well. So again, even though we have the wizard on and we're getting all that automatic stuff working for us, I can change the step down if I don't want to use this tool uh, at full depth. If, it's, if, if my holder is not uh, as rigid enough, maybe the machine, maybe uh, I'm not holding this in a vise tight enough, maybe it's just a couple of clamps. Whatever the situation is, you have control over the overall calculation of this. Machining level is how aggressive those feeds and speed calculations and those cu cutting angle calculations become. So right now we're at level three, and you can see we have a feed rate of 90 inches per minute, just above 3,400 RPM. If I slide this all the way to the right, you'll see that those numbers increase, and that little red icon there, that red graphic, increases and decreases as I slide this back and forth. That's because iMachining's main focus is the chip thickness, the chip load. And we regulate everything else about the toolpath to maintain that chip load. So the feed, the speed, the step down, the step over, cutting angles, all of that gets regulated to maintain the chip load. And you'll see that that aggressiveness is related to the chip load there as well. So if I leave that at level eight, you can see that we're taking a, a really thick cut there. If we go to modify cutting conditions, we add further parameters. So whatever else you know about your machine and your material, you can plug it in here to further dial it in. Uh, one you'll notice here is turbo mode. What turbo mode does is it essentially doubles that chip thickness, so it makes it even more aggressive. You can consider this now to be levels 9 to 16 when you have turbo mode turned on. Additional to that, you have max spin. Let's say I've plugged in parameters on this machine, this material, and I'm using an end mill that has a holder that only can go up to uh, maybe, in this case, let's say 2,000 RPM just for the sake of, of what we have here. We right now, uh, iMachine is calculated just above 3,800 3, RPM. But let's say we can only go up to 2,000 RPM. I would type in 2,000 there, and it would recalculate the entire toolpath to make sure that we only use a maximum of 2,000 RPM. So whatever you plug in there, further dials in the toolpath, further optimizes the toolpath. Under technology, uh, this is an automatic toolpath. It's basically just going to do all the step over, step down for us. So whatever you want to control additionally in terms of efficiency of the morphing spiral and such, this is just another way to further dial in the toolpath. What you really just want to focus on on this window for, 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 for basics is the wall offset and the floor offset. This is still a pocketing toolpath. We can tell it what we want it to do in terms of wall offset, floor offset. And by default, it does a helical entry. So you can leave this as the default, or if you want to change the ramping angle, you can do that by checking this box. If you have a non-center cutting tool, you can uncheck this box and control the step down of that helix. But otherwise, we can just do a save and calculate, and we'll get the toolpath. Since we've added two tools in this tool me menu here, if I click on this, we can see that we get different parameters for the different tools. So if tool 24 was at level 8 turbo, maybe I'm not holding tool 1 as well. So I'll leave that at level 3. So you can see that you get independent controls by clicking this up here. If we take a look at that toolpath, there is the one inch tool engaging it with just a simple 2D I machining on that inside pocket. You can see it does a helical entry to get into the part. If we take a look at this at the top view, it goes from that helical entry into a morphing spiral. 
And then as it gets further out, it matches the, the, the shape of the pocket. As it gets into corners, you can see that it actually never does a 90 degree turn. It never buries the tool. What it's doing is it's controlling the cutting angle to work its way in there while still maintaining that material engagement, that chip load. To reduce cycle time, you'll see that there is minimal retractions. There's really just the one entry and the one exit. Everything else in there is a retraction, but skimming across the surface of an area that it already knows it machined. So we're reducing cycle time just by reducing the number of retractions. That same toolpath created this second one. Because I, sim I simply just chose that half inch tool in my tool list, it recalculated the toolpath as a rest operation, and it focused on just the corners that the previous tool could not do. So one toolpath generated those two toolpaths there. Let's take a look at the other options from, from the recognition uh, functions. Just open this guy up here. Using this option here, we're doing the outside of the part. So from our stock and target definitions, you can see from the preview, once you start using recognitions, you get the preview, and it shows us that it understands that from the outside of the part to my stock definition, it's gonna machine all that. So I didn't actually have to choose any geometry. This is purely based off of the stock and target definitions. Everything else is pretty much the same. I put in the same tool, same machining levels. Under levels itself, it read from the stock that I wanna start probably that 10th thou of the stock above there, so it automatically recognized that. And it's just going down to the bottom face of the part because it's not sure if I wanna go past that, so it just defaults to the bottom of the part. And that's essentially it. It just does the outside of the part. Because it recognizes that it's coming from the outside of the part, it knows it doesn't have to do the helical entry. You can see that it just has a plunge from the outside and does a radial entry. Let's take a look at another function, and that is the first one. So feature recognition by faces. You would have seen in the previous video for pocketing that we have something called smart face. Smart face allows me to choose just the face of the pocket, the bottom face of the pocket, and it reads the edges for me. What 2D eye machining does as well is it recognizes the stock. So in addition to, we kind of zoom in here a little bit, in addition to the chain from the pocket, it also recognizes that I left that 10th thou from the previous pass. So it actually is feathering out a little bit to just machine that material while still leaving that 10th thou because if I go to technology, I'm still leaving 10th out there. So I'm still roughing it out, but purely recognizing it from the remaining stock, it knew how much of the material I wanted to machine. So I just chose those pockets, it found those edges, and then recognized the, uh, the stock for me. So again, all of that is recognition, even recognize the bottom of the pocket there. So simple enough, if we take a look at that toolpath, again, it knows open edges, it's gonna work its way from the outside. And to show the last function, I'm just going to suppress all these, and then we'll just recalculate this one. The reason being is because it's working off the updated stock, I need the stock to represent uh, the, the material that I'm actually going to cut. So if I left those toolpaths there, it would have updated the stock, and this one toolpath would have done nothing. This is redoing that center pocket, but with the last function, which is recognition, but only by chains. This is when you have a through pocket or you don't have a pocket that has a nice flat bottom. You need, you need to define the pocket just using chains, which I've done here. But I still get that preview because it's recognizing the stock. So if we go through that, it's gonna ask me for my, my levels, which I did as well. And it just does the exact same pocket. This time though, just defined by a chain and by the bottom level. It recognizes the top of the stock for me. So all we're really doing here is just choosing different geometries that we have available to us, using the recognition to see how much of the stock I needed to machine, and uh, uh, it's still using eye machining to to um, to regulate the uh, the feed and speed to optimize that toolpath. Any questions of this or anything else from Solcan, just give us a call at 1-866-975-1115, extension 2. You can, uh, you can send us your parts or your questions via the ticket system at solcansupport.com, and stay tuned for the rest of the videos in this YouTube channel and this video series. Thanks for watching.